engineered racing machine. If you got them going fast enough, you could actually drive them round on the ceiling. Built to test the limits of automotive design. Without the regulations, we could build a racing car that would race at speeds of 300 miles an hour. A chariot of fire for those who dream of victory. It would be very difficult to get a racing driver to drive a car that was extremely safe, but really rather slow. A star-spangled world where teams spend millions to gain those precious tenths of a second that divide failure from success. A perpetual quest to build the ultimate. serious about motor racing, this is what you drive. The 2004 Formula One car. With its driver, it weighs around 600 kilos. It can go from 0 to 100 in under four seconds and reach a top speed of over 200 miles per hour. It's the world's ultimate racing car. But how did such an awesome and beautiful machine evolve? How did we get here? The first Grand Prix was held at Le Mans in 1906. From the earliest days of the automobile, men wanted to race. By the 1950s, Maserati and Ferrari were building cars with four and a half liter engines positioned in front of the driver. Races were won and lost on one thing, engine power. But in a backstreet garage in Surbiton, England, engineer John Cooper was building racing cars with engines that were smaller and positioned behind the driver. It all started in the 1940s when my father and his best friend Eric Brandon decided to build uh, a racing car. Um, and with crash bits that they found uh, lying around in the garage, um, they came up with the whole idea and the concept of the little Cooper 500. You can see the engine here is a, is a Norton 500cc engine and is directly linked through its gearbox with a chain drive direct to the rear axle. And this was really the beginning of the rear engine revolution. And what you saw then in the Cooper was the engine positioned behind the driver and you optimised the balance. So the car didn't have a huge engine but it went faster because it had greater levels of grip around the corners. By the end of the 1961 season, every Formula One team had positioned this engine behind the driver. In 1965, the mighty Ford Motor Company approached two young British engineers, Keith Duckworth and Mike Costin, who'd recently formed a company called Cosworth. Ford offered Cosworth £100,000 to design and build a totally new racing engine. The result was the double four valve, or DFV. This is the first time that an engine has been specifically designed for Formula One, but it was also very light because it simply formed part of the car. It bolted onto the back of the car. But position alone wasn't enough to make the DFV a race winner. It also needed power. And the DFV produced a lot more power than any other racing engine. And all that came about because of um, just rigorous attention to the detail of every little bit of the engine. Right. Working with a small team of engineers, Keith Duckworth and Mike Costin went right back to first principles, looking at the physics and chemistry of every single aspect of the engine to work out the ideal mix of components. And the result was an engine which, which revolutionised the whole sport. Today's Formula One engine is deliberately built to last the length of a race weekend and no further. You'd be lucky to get from London to Edinburgh before it needs a rebuild. If they survive much longer, then we've done something wrong because some of the parts are too heavy. So the ideal Formula One engine would blow up as it crossed the finish line in first place. But if a single component gives up too early, it spells disaster. At Jordan Racing, this engine has just come back from the test track. It's performed well and it looks okay but is there hidden damage? To find out, engine and gearbox will be stripped down, 
Every gearbox component will be tested using a test called magnetic particle inspection. To the naked eye, this gearbox ratio looks fine. But when a special ink is poured over it and a magnetic field applied, it's a different story. UV light reveals how the magnetic field has drawn the ink into a minute flaw in the metal. That flaw could have led to gearbox failure and forced Jordan out of a Grand Prix. A modern Formula One engine produces phenomenal performance. The 40-valve 3-litre V10 kicks out close to 900 horsepower and runs at a staggering 18,000 revolutions per minute. Ever greater engine power. A crucial component in the quest to build the ultimate racing machine. But higher speeds mean faster cornering. As the 1960s advanced, designers had to find new ways to keep the car on the track. For inspiration, they started to look at how planes fly. These are probably the most significant cars I've designed in my career. John Barnard, a legend in Formula One design. If you analyse a Formula One car today, the engine is probably 50% of the performance of the car. If we leave the driver aside, because the driver does make a difference, I mean, you still need your Michael Schumacher if you're going to be world champion. But I think aerodynamics is probably 40% of the remaining 50%. By the mid-60s, improvements in tyre design were allowing cars to corner faster. To keep the car on the track, engineers had the idea to harness airflow over the car to produce what became known as downforce. Downforce is really a, a, a way of maximising tyre performance, using wings upside down. So with an aeroplane, you take off, if you turn the wing upside down, the quicker you go, it pushes the car onto the road. For a time in the late 60s, cars sprouted elevated wings. But they were flimsy structures. After serious accidents in 1969, they were banned. Deprived of their high wings, designers turned again to aerospace technology to improve the aerodynamics of their cars. Since they discovered the wind tunnel, they've never looked back. At Lola Racing's half-scale wind tunnel in Huntingdon, Chris Saunders is carrying out a test on a half-scale model of an American champ car. The car is suspended on a strap which is mounted on, in simple terms, a set of upside-down bathroom scales. That's the easiest way to describe it. These scales on the tunnel's ceiling apply forces down, through the strap, to the model and read changes in its weight and balance as it's subjected to the equivalent of 145 miles an hour. The data is passed to the tunnel's computer for analysis. It looks like the car will probably take a bit more front. Chris orders the angle of the small upper flap at the front of the car to be adjusted by just two degrees. He then orders the test to be run again. That's about what we would expect as there's been a movement to the front of the car, the centre pressure has moved forward. Now 38 degrees, 32 degrees of uh, extra front flap. The computer calculates that the small adjustment to the flap on the model will add more than 10 kilos of extra downforce to the front end of the real car. The wind tunnel data will make the front end of the car firmer and easier to steer into corners at high speed, which will give the driver greater confidence. But it was in an early, far more primitive tunnel that engineers made the most significant aerodynamic discovery in the history of the racing car. A discovery that changed the face of Formula One forever. In 1970, Colin Chapman of Lotus launched the wedge-shaped Lotus 72. Aerodynamically ahead of anything else around, it won 20 Grand Prix and three World Constructors' Championships. 
Then, in 1976, using a wind tunnel, Lotus designer Peter Wright discovered underbody aerodynamics, a uniquely powerful way to generate downforce. He called the discovery ground effect. Ground effect is a, is a simple theory. Uh, it, it works on the Venturi principle, um, which is that air flowing through a restriction has to speed up. And when it speeds up, the pressure drops. In 1978, Lotus won the world championship with its ground effect car. The secret of its success was sculpted wings hidden beneath the car. A vital part was these sliding skirts, which actually ran along in contact with the track and moved up and down um, along with the bumps in the track and effectively divided the high pressure area outside of the car from the low pressure area underneath. Um, and that created a terrific amount of downforce. With the competition struggling to work out the dark secret of the 79's success, Lotus went on to win race after race. But Formula One's governing body was growing fearful that ground effect cars were simply too fast and too dangerous. The cornering effect that could have been generated by ground effect was enormous. And it's no joke to say that drivers would have been needing G-suits. In 1982, ground effect cars were banned from Formula One. But a new generation of aerodynamicists has found other ways to generate downforce. When ground effect cars were banned, there was a sudden loss of downforce. Um, at the time, I suppose most engineers didn't think we would ever get it back, but we've got it back and we've increased the levels of downforce to levels unimaginable back in those days. They've done it by paying attention to every fine detail in wind tunnel testing. There's various aspects of this car, each of them may only add up to two or three kilos of, of downforce, but when you've got 100 or 200 fine areas of detail added up, that's hundreds of kilos of downforce. Maximum downforce requires high pressure above the car or component and low pressure beneath. Red indicates high air pressure and blue low pressure in this simulation by Advantage CFD. The CFD stands for Computational Fluid Dynamics. Um, and it's basically simulating a, a car and simulating air flowing over that car on a simulated test track or even in a simulated wind tunnel. These equations to show fluid flow were written in Victorian times. They were too long and complicated to use until computers came along. And the computer solves millions of equations um, to give us some kind of visualization results we can look at the configuration of the car, so we can see if the rear wing and the front wing are set up correctly to give them maximum downforce. To complement wind tunnel research, every Formula One team uses CFD simulation. Where they're heading is to be able to have two cars in that simulation and possibly one overtaking the other. This will help drivers anticipate when to come out of the slipstream to overtake. Advances in aerodynamic design have made cars faster. But changes to the shape of the car have also obliged designers and engineers to look for new construction materials. By 1980, cars had become far more aerodynamically efficient but to get good airflow low down, they'd also become narrower and less strong. Oh, I started thinking, how do I get this strength back? I want it small, I want it narrow down there, but I don't want to give up strength. So then I started thinking, okay, maybe we have to change materials. Up to now, cars had been made of steel and aluminium. Visiting a British aerospace factory, Barnard saw engine panels being made of carbon fiber. It was enough to give me the idea that here was a material that had all the right answers. It was very light. You could make it very strong or very stiff, whatever you wanted, just by how you put together the carbon fibers. Returning to his office at McLaren, Barnard had a brilliant idea he would build the very first racing car monocoque made entirely of carbon fiber composite. And so I sat down and started working on the carbon fiber monocoque, which became the 
McLaren MP41. Barnard set a pattern that is now universal in Formula One. And the use of carbon fiber hasn't stopped at the monocoque. Excluding the engine, 80% of today's Formula One car is built of carbon. With carbon, you can vary the characteristics, which means that you can make very lightweight, very thin bodywork, or you can make enormously strong components like gearbox cases and suspension, so it's the adaptability is its key. There's another reason carbon fibre has taken over from steel and aluminium in the building of a Formula One car. This wishbone, which is uh, part of the suspension system holding the wheel on, is from about 93, 94, handmade in steel, hand welded. If we put that on the scale, we can see that we've got a shade over 1.3 kilos. Uh, if we now pick up a carbon fiber wishbone, like this, um, this is be circa about 2000, 2001, um, we can see that the fittings now are in titanium. The main part of the wishbone is in carbon. And if we put that on the scale, we've got a shade under 0.6 kilos. So that's about 40% of the weight of the original steel component. With around 3,000 components on a Formula One car, excluding the engine, the weight-saving benefits of carbon are huge. But when John Barnard launched the first ever car with a carbon fibre monocoque in 1981, people had doubts about how the new wonder material would stand up in a high-speed crash. There were a lot of comments about, wait till it hits something, you'll just see a cloud of black dust. In fact, what happened in the first year of running the carbon fibre monocoque, John Watson, through a driver error, it must be said, um, went off the road in Monza, uh, travelling at high speed, probably 170, 180 miles an hour, and completely lost it. Came back on the road, went across the track, and smashed into the armco on the other side of the road. Now, the effect was that it actually ripped the engine off the back of the monocoque. And it was very dramatic because the oil tank cracked and some oil went on the exhaust and there was a flash fire and so on. And everybody went, oh my God, that's it. When all the dust settled, um, Watson just unbuckled his belt and stepped out of this carbon monocoque, which was completely intact and in fact had worked brilliantly as a safety cell. But John Barnard admits that driver safety was not uppermost in his mind when he built a car out of carbon. Driver safety, in terms of the design of the car, probably came somewhere down the list. As a designer, you're not going to be the only one to have a fantastically safe car and be the slowest one on the grid. Performance was number one. But striving for performance can sometimes lead to disaster. And in recent years, regulations have obliged designers to move safety steadily up the list. When you see a racing car crash, um, quite often you see what seem to be fairly large lumps come off the car. Now, the anomaly is that, that from a driver's point of view, most times that's a good thing. If when he hits, he rips his wheels off, A, he's taking energy out of the impact, and B, he's removing what could be a dangerous item in terms of damage to him. Ridding the car of dangerous items is a design priority. It's meant thinking outside the envelope to find new ways of constructing components. Uh, these pieces illustrate the process used in making a Formula One nose cone. Um, we start here with this piece made from solid aluminium, pocketed out to remove some weight, still very heavy. From that we make a carbon mould because this is what we want on the outside of the nose cone. We then make the outer skin, which is very thin, can deflect this quite easily. Inside that outer skin, we fit lightweight aluminium honeycomb core. And we eventually, we end up with this. So if we look inside this nose cone, we can see, all we see is carbon skin. But in fact, between there and there is a honeycomb core like that. But fundamentally, that has to take the crash test. When John Barnard built the first carbon fiber monocoque in the 1980s, he chose the new wonder material because it was light and strong. 
but over the years, it's also shown itself to be remarkably safe. Because it crumples. And as it crumples, it absorbs energy. The objective in all these crash tests is to absorb energy, to break up all the little pieces of carbon. The nearer you can get to making your component into a pile of black dust, the more energy you've absorbed. That's the theory. But how does it work in practice? This is the JF-14, the latest state-of-the-art Jordan car. But like every new Formula One car, it will have to pass a series of crash tests before it's allowed to race. So, how will it do? On the test rig, first the nose cone then the side impact bars. And finally, the rear crash structure are all impacted to simulate the huge forces the car would be subjected to in a high-speed crash. Its carbon fiber components have done their job. Jordan's new car has successfully passed its impact tests and is ready to compete in the new Grand Prix season. The use of carbon fiber composite has played a revolutionary role in making the racing car significantly safer. But has it brought the world's most highly engineered racing machine closer to the ultimate? People have often asked me what I think the ultimate racing car is. It's almost impossible because everything that races today is raced to some sort of regulation. There's very few limits to how fast we could drive without regulations. We could probably double or treble the downforce within a matter of months. We could take a lot of weight out of the car, change the wheelbase, reducing lap times by tens of seconds without too much difficulty very quickly. A Formula One world without regulation would certainly be an exciting place. But would it be worth the price? touch wood I'm very lucky can say that I've never had a driver killed in one of my cars. I know I've had one or two big accidents and the effect as the prime mover in the design of that car is fundamental certainly to me and I would have thought twice about carrying on if something had happened. To say throw away the regulations and build whatever you want is a sort of impossible situation really. So I'm not sure that the ultimate racing car has been built and I'm not sure it can be built but as long as men continue